Namaskar, Mr. Shorka. Welcome to this conversation on Indian museums. May I take you back to your successful stint as Secretary Ministry of Culture, Government of India between 2008 and 2012 and ask you how you see Indian museums in the global context. We could start with the Indian Museum in Kolkata because on 2nd of February it's going to complete 202 years. It was the first such institution which was set up in entire Asia-Pacific region. We'd like to know from you how it's been, what the journey looks like and what the future holds for museums and museologists in our country. Thank you. There are two separate questions. One is about the Indian Museum and the other is about museums in India. Right. If I've understood. Right. You. Correct. Let's start with the Indian Museum. That is the first museum in India. Now, there is a feeling that India had a lot of museums before the British came, but I'm sorry to disappoint people on that score. Indians never cultivated a tradition of keeping dead and old things. We had this concept of purity and pollution. So everything that was old was supposed to be, after its period of uh, life, was supposed to be consigned to the waters or burnt. We didn't have a strong tradition of acquiring or hoarding of things from the past. And that is a fact. I was going through the Muslim period of our, um, the Muslim rule in India and found that even though they had a few collections, they were not public collections. The first idea of a museum is not a collection. A king or a samrat or a nawab can have a collection, but it has to be open to the public. So that makes it a public museum. So they may have a few collections. They are words like uh, records uh, kept in the Mahafiz Khana, the Tosha Khana for gifts and antiquities, but there were not no evidence of them being open to the public. So right through our history up to, if I may use the term, up to 1790s, uh, we never had a sense of collection unless somebody can refute what I'm saying. 1784, the first body of intellectual inquiry in the modern sense of the term, in the colonial sense of the term, comes up with the with the Asiatic Society. And one of the jobs of the Asiatic Society was to collect specimens of everything they wanted to know, to tell their members. So whether it be a botanical specimen or whether it be a piece of rock for which geological purposes or even an artifact or a stone inscription they would be collecting. So the Asiatic Society is not exactly limited to the small buildings that we see on Park Street today. It actually extended all the way for a, almost a mile backwards along the Chorungi to cover areas that would now come to the new market. It's a huge area. They had a backyard where they could just dump. They had some small rooms. Now, this collection of the Asiatic Society was constituted into the Indian Museum in 1814. That is a head start for any museum in Asia and the Pacific. In fact, in the whole of East, China had a strong tradition of collecting. It did not consider old things to be dead and polluting or a dead man's clothes were not uh, something prohibited. Japan also had some cultures. There are others, but the Indian Museum, we are concerned in India, in the modern era, the first systematic collection. And coming to the wider question of museums in India, we had other museums coming up in the 19th century. We had the Prince of Wales. We had the the Delhi Museum, National Museum comes in very late, comes up only in the 1950s when they could not shift the Indian Museum to Delhi, so to say. The new nation needed a museum, but we have about nine major museums all over India. One of them uh, in Chennai is owned by the state government. State government museum or the Egmore Museum. Salar Jung started as a private collection in Hyderabad. Chhatrapati Shivaji Manav Vastu Sangrahale is a new name for the Prince of Wales Museum in Mumbai. It has a fantastic collection. 
and then we have the National Museum, we have the Allahabad Museum, we have another excellent state museum, the Mathura Museum. The Gandhara Museum, of course, has gone on to the Pakistani side. So we have 200 or at least about 150-year-old tradition all over India in collecting. More important than that is a sense that India's collections are something that the world could die for. It is other than the Egyptian, to some extent the Babylonian, to whatever extent China has been able to salvage, in spite of its strong tradition, there are just about four civilizations that go back to that antiquity, and Egypt is the oldest. There's no doubt about it. But once we move on from Egypt, which had historical economic reasons for its prosperity much before the others, India stands among the first four in the world. I mean, when I refer to India, I'm referring to undivided India. So that would be perhaps India, Pakistan, Bangladesh today has the strong heritage, a sense of his linear history that goes back to about 5,000 years. It's lucky for us that we have a lot of remains, a lot of very well-kept, preserved items from the Harappan civilization, which is the first that we have come across so far. So our collections are something that the world would give any price to have, which is one of the reasons why so many of them are smuggled out at periodic intervals. But I can see the reverse trend happening. For the last year or so, there is a strong enthusiasm among countries to return back stolen antiquities or antiquities that came in the wrong way that have been identified to have been taken off from India. So we have got about 15 or 17 such important items in the last two years. And so we have this collection, but then there are issues. How about museologists? Do they play an active role? Because as far as the global mm. scenario goes, perhaps India does not figure very prominently. Why is that the case? I have my own assumption or theories about it. You see, art study, if that is the wider term that we use, museology as a discipline was something like library science, something like archivists. Now, these supporting services of education, laboratory, library, archives, even to some extent archaeology, though archaeology is more academic, museology, these services, if I may use, or these cadres, as we can call them, were transferred to the Ministry of Culture or the Department of Culture about 30 years ago when the split took place between the Ministry of Education and the Department of Culture. I have always said it was a wrong decision. They could have stayed as two departments under the same roof, under the same ministry, because what happened as a result was Department of Education, Ministry of HRD or whatever we call it, they ensured that central universities, central institutions, and thereby all other universities through what we call the UGC norms and scales did get a lot of benefits in terms of entitlements, in terms of career prospects. In fact, I have seen the jump taking place in front of my eyes. A professor was uh, equated with a director just above the deputy secretary and how the professor has been given his due place today. The short point is that while the academic community could move forward with a lot of social and economic encouragement, the supporting services fell behind. Culture being a smaller cousin was not considered important enough to be given the same benefits. Therefore, whether it be art teachers, whether it be antiquarians, archaeologists, museologists, archivists, even um, epigraphists, museology is not a singular profession in its own right, in the sense that uh, not anyone in museology would know everything that has to be done. For instance, when you have to decipher an uh, inscription, you require trained epigraphists. The number of epigraphists is so poor that I shudder to think what will happen when a new inscription comes up another 10 years later. 
we just don't have people people have left the vocation they have moved on after studies to try desperately to cling on to the academic bus the best of art university art institute students have gravitated to christies sotheby's and the foreign museums which means that there is a real paucity of good talent strong talent in these domains but how do you energize the sector now mr shorkar given our mm. rich heritage it's very important that we do so the ministry of culture has actually taken up schemes a project if i may put it to send five batches of young museum scholars practitioners and museologists if i may or gallery specialist uh, if i remember correctly three batches have gone to the british museum it was on payment basis and one or two went to the victoria and albert one perhaps went to the metropolitan so these five six batches would be covering about maybe 150 of the most competitive brains that are there now this encouraged all of a sudden a lot of young students many of them are willing to stay back in our museums or to help out the private museums uh, to us you and me doesn't make a difference because as long as someone is taking care of the antiquities of india whether a private one or a public one frankly i feel that the public museums have reached their tired out point would you therefore say that we should just step back mm. or step out and let the private sector play a more prominent role we tried a lot to change the character of government museums because within the government framework a museum is very difficult to run you require to change your electricity your lighting to suit the ambient suit the requirement of the object you see when i see the lights that fall upon our paintings which are even though they are vegetable dyes the amount of erosion the amount of corrosion the amount of destruction that is taking place is phenomenal but if we call standard government engineer and tell him this he will switch it off to some new variety without actually knowing that a specific gallery requires a specific lighting so the standardization of procedures within the government makes it completely unsuitable now in But, this situation mm-hmm. are you at all hopeful that the government can do something what do you mm-hmm. think the government could be doing in a situation like this okay that we put it like this the national museum did a stunning turn around in just about one year's time with one dedicated officer one dynamic officer maybe he stayed for a year and a half or something i'm not sure somebody who was wedded to culture could sort of bring in teams bring in people with him and uh, i guess he couldn't stay long enough then we had the indian museum which had a very slow start in its 200 year celebrations but finally picked up in the last 2 years which was just about 4 years ago the indian museum has improved considerably but it took about 7 years of battering because i'm told that the people there were so self righteous that they knew everything and they didn't really require any advice so are you saying mm-hmm. there is more a personalized initiative that the system itself will not support improvements and modernization it's only when individuals who are very passionate very concerned step in that change happens to a large extent yes in the indian context because we are all governed by the same set of rules and one takes that one could take that as an excuse for not going forward one could take that as an opportunity to go forward it all largely depends when the ground rules are the same huge ground rules how a person passionately chases it i have seen the turn around in two to three museums and it's not the same i mean it's not that government museums alone suffer from this fault the best example i can give you is the prince of wales or chhatrapati shivaji museum in mumbai where the board of trustees or the board of governors i'm not sure which has been a very very enlightened board and they have coaxed and cajoled and uh, allowed the directors to 
encourage the directors to functions as a result of which we had three good directors following one upon the other and no massive enquiries whenever something good was done the, the nature of government museum is the moment to start so chhatrapati shivaji is now world class victoria memorial always had a world class infrastructure i would say that victoria memorial also has something of a world class institution the perception mm-hmm. matters so how do you establish a closer connect mm-hmm. with the cockneys into you with the discerning public so that they can also act as pressure points on such institutions to improve uh, one uh, way out was to have friends of museums a new movement and uh, that has been tried out in fact i think all the museums now have in small or large degrees but the friends of museums succeeded more in uh, chhatrapati shivaji the director was egged on by the by his superiors to be in daily touch with them in some museums the friends of museum turned out to be just a ritual where they thought they could come and direct the affairs of the museum and the director spent all his time explaining to them that he could not so the friends of museum is one the other one is to permit activities and ideas and curation by outstanding people what happens is a museum has to have an event going on all the time in fact two to three events that makes it worth while for even a citizen of that city to visit it would you say mm-hmm. that the private mm-hmm. sector has been more successful in setting up and running museums than the government sector all over the world yes except of course britain where the british museum the victoria and albert came up with a lot of government support in the rest of the world it has been depending on the culture of the country in america it is almost all privately run all there may be some amount of government funding from behind but most of them are run by private trusts and they are the best examples of having. what is it like in india india is not yet caught on to the idea and i know why We Can you tell the, us why? Uh, the Antiquities Act. The Antiquities Act mercifully is under severe examination now. It was brought in for a particular purpose to stop the smuggling or the taking out of antiquities in the 70s. But because of certain constricting features, the collectors of antiquities really could not come forward. I believe very strongly that if the Antiquities Act is amended, to allow freer movements of antiquities and artifacts within the country with proper watch then the museum scene in india will explode how does technology come into play here popularizing the museum movement almost all the museums are now on website but when i open many of the websites i find they are last updated in november or october so this has to be very dynamic it has to have this newsletter circuit where you go on expanding expanding through visitors cards and others so that you are told every now and then not through a cyclo style type of thing but through a very attractive flyer that this is happening we have to have a little flexible hours museums are rather prudish things even in britain you will find they close at a particular time but then when there are special events you can have to keep the museum extended till 9 or 8 which permits the office goer to make it otherwise one has to really slip out of office during office hours to see a museum it is difficult it's mm. a question of getting people mm. more and more involved and engaging their attention mm. is that what you are referring to yes there are you see when you go around the foreign museums what attracts you the most a little toddling boys and girls of so just 2 and 3 and 5 who are led by a school ma'am or a school teacher in little groups and they sit silently around a painting and they inculcate the virtues of a painting or a sculpture or a piece of history when they are very impressionable in india i don't think that ever takes place so we can't blame the museums for everything by the time a kid is in middle school he is pressurized by society to appear for iit iim iaas or what or whatever starts with an i 
and uh, his, his so value how, system changed. How do you affect the shift from apathy mm-hmm. to interest? We have to trust the private experts to a large extent. We have still have this feeling that they come here only for their interest, for their own name and fame, because they want to bring out a book. Now, I've often asked my museum heads, what's wrong with it? If a part of your splendid collections came out through a book, and he or she photographed and took them and wrote copious notes, your museum would be more famous. I think there is a sense of competition within India among the gallerists and curators and other exhibition staff that their books should also appear. They feel that you're working in New York and all you do is to come after five years, come every month on American expense, take a few photographs, write a fancy book and then make a name for yourself, organize an exhibition. Now that is no way of looking at life. That is no way. Well, I guess they're just yeah. reflecting the way society looks at them. Yes. They are not uh, center stage. Uh, uh, they are not center stage. So, so you are very right when you say that if we gave them that amount of honor to our museum personnel, gave them that amount of encouragement, I have seen for myself how enterprising museum people can turn gallery around on their own. As head hmm. of the public broadcast, I believe you are setting up a sound museum which is very exciting. Could you tell us hmm. a little bit more about this initiative of yours? We are working a lot on the archives. Now, the difference between what we call tangible heritage in the form of paintings, antiquities, sculptures, and intangible heritage in the sense of a nation's pride in its own collection of songs, of its talks, of its speeches, of its books, has vanished. So, one can't get fixated. For instance, if you are looking at five musical instruments, you should be in a position as you walk past each and you press a button, you'd be able to hear a tune at least, so know how it sounds. So that's the marriage between the tangible and the intangible. All India Radio is institution India should be proud of. It has the largest collection of archival sound. Sound means not only uh, music and instruments, but also speeches, also uh, plays, a lot of spoken word as well. Now, digitizing these analog tapes and spools have been a difficult thing, but the rate of production needs to come out. Now, where our preservation of our archives are concerned, Akashvani has already put up a lot of uh, speeches of national leaders during the freedom movement up on the website. Now, here their museum should not be a set, dodgy, dark hall where you have to enter and see because sound is something that you can get on the airwaves and the business of radio has always been on magnetic waves so why do you need to drag people to a dark hall air and its archives they are working on it and they have reached a stage when they can come out with a lot of more materials that sounds really interesting I'm sure everybody will be looking forward to setting up of that museum they have started a lot that's of that's very very encouraging mm-hmm. How do you see the future mm-hmm. for museums in our country? When will they become a must-visit place for Indian citizens and those interested around the world? Well, the encouraging point is that there is a ferocious love for one's country and culture, the strong love that has come up in the last 10-15 years. This patriotism is a different issue. It's a love for my country. But the fact that People are aggressively saying that we are one of the oldest civilizations in the world is actually fulfilling the first requirement for museums. Once you are convinced that you have, you are the descendants of a civilization that goes back to such a long period, the next thing would be to tell you to come and understand it. Our problem is we have never been able to explain to them, to the people. I'll give an example. You go into a museum, you'll find broken pieces of pottery. To you, it might sound like teacups, other than teacups being smashed somewhere. So, it doesn't make much sense to a normal person. If you explain to them that these are the first tools used by man, and those who made these pots could boil the water and thus save their stomachs from infection, 
and they are the survivors and those who did not use the pots are all dead mm-hmm. and therefore these pots were used by my ancestor the very fact of having a shrad mm-hmm. or a piece shows that this has in its simple eloquence the genes of the survivor do you think a fresh beginning could be made in the next international museum day on 18th of may for which the theme has already been decided cultural landscapes and museums it's a wonderful initiative taken but i think we need to replicate it in other places as well delhi has the advantage of a capital town of engaging attention it has the disadvantage of an attention deficit syndrome so because there are so many events people can't uh, sort of cling on to one whereas the regional capitals and the state capitals and others have their quota but certainly not of international fame the best idea would have been to synchronize a series of events all over india focusing on the world museum day and that would be the best idea maybe the government could pick up on that and make a big splash i would not be sure but mm-hmm. they may have something mm-hmm. but i think involving a chain of 12 museums and then a chain of another 24 museums below them would sort of stimulate and if you start working for 2 to 3 months then you involve school children you involve college children you involve the whole community well, i'm sure a lot of our listeners are already buzzing with ideas mm-hmm. and we may be able to have a very very happening international museums day this year thank you so much mr shorkar thank you